evening, brothers and sisters from across the world here gathered. I trust you've had a wonderful time here this um, few days. I want to say that I bring you greetings from your fellow Christians in Nigeria, and they all wish you well, and that God will bless you from this conference, and you go back to your own countries to continue with the work the Lord has assigned to you. I come from Nigeria, where I served the church for 41 years in various capacities before I retired. Oh, sorry, retired? No. Before I was reassigned to another duty, because there are some people here who have forbidden me from using that word, retired. So, four years ago, when I uh, stepped down from the office of primate of Nigeria, I began to think of what to do, and the Lord laid upon me to work for young people, to empower them, to train them, and to give them skill acquisition programs. And so we set up this huge training center for youths in Abekuta, my hometown. And one day, Christmas Eve, Tuesday, December 24, last year, I went to that center to bring food to the workers so that they could have something for Christmas Day. As I was coming out of that center, two young men with guns crossed us and took away my car, my driver, and myself to a very thick bush at half past two in the afternoon. For seven long hours in the bush, from half past two to half past nine, it was a nightmare. It's an experience you would never wish your worst enemy. Have you ever come face to face with death? Hello? Have you? Maybe not. Well, I have. These young men hit me hard with gun bars. And they put gun on my head. Asking for money. I said, I'm a retired village pastor. I have no money. But how about this big car? The church gave it to me in retirement. Oh. And I prayed. And I prayed. After sunset, they ordered me and my driver to come out of the car. And they took everything that was on me, my clothes, except my pants and a singlet, and barefooted to walk further into the bush. Of course, I had to comply. But thereafter, after long praying, the Lord had my prayers. And unknown to me, people were already praying all, all over the world. I didn't know how the news got out. People were already praying for me all over the world. So the Lord came to my rescue. I came to the main road. It was dark. I was half naked. I didn't know where to go. Then I said, Lord God, you have delivered me from these people. They've gone with my vehicle. That's fine. But I will not sleep in this bush. Send your angels to take me away from here. <laughs> Two minutes thereafter, a vehicle was coming. I saw the headlamp. And I was so scared. Were these the same people who kidnapped me? Was some other group? Who were they? I didn't know. But somebody said, but you just prayed God to send you his holy angels. Those are the angels coming. And so they came, they were the policemen, and they took me back to town. Now, one of the policemen in the vehicle said to me, the only reason God spared my life and didn't allow those men to kill me was because he wanted me to do a lot more to restore hope of the hopeless and to walk more courageously fighting the ills of my own society. Look at this man. Is God speaking through him or what? <laughs> Following morning in church on Christmas Day, the pastor brought the same message. Then I concluded, oh, 
I thought I retired four years ago. Indeed, the Lord is not done with me. Not yet. I have my work to do. My dear friends in Christ, the phenomena of hope, truth, and courage seems to me to be the vital boost that is greatly needed by all strata of leadership. And that is because in today's world, from the smallest hamlets in Africa to the great cities in Europe and America, there's so much despair, agony, misery are widespread. Life has become so problematic that many have lost their faith and they have, res they have resigned to faith, to faith. And of course, there are those who are searching for truth and earnestly seeking to know the mind of God about what to believe and what actions to take. But there are very few. There are very few. The vast majority of people around the world today tends to be consumed by hopelessness. And this situation is begging for those who will lead them aright so that their hope in God can be restored. Let me share with you very quickly what I call the David example. You all know the story of King David before he became king. There was this big battle between Israelites and the Philistines. And the Philistines, of course, you know, they were experienced in war. They had a lot of uh, weapons. Israelites, they didn't have much. And they had their captain, or was it their general, Goliath, a huge man, was said to be um, almost 10 feet in height. The bronze helmet on his head weighed 126 pounds. And this man reduced the battle to a duel. That Israel should get somebody, and they will get somebody, and they should fight. And whoever won will have won the victory on behalf of his people. Of course, they knew the odds were in their favor. And there was no one in Israel who could match Goliath. No one. Then came around this little boy called David. No experience. Has never seen war before. He never fought any battle before, and he volunteered. Was he crazy? Of course, those around him thought he was crazy. But David wasn't crazy. He had his trust firmly anchored in God, his creator. And he said to Goliath, I want to urge you to read his words in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when you get back home. Please take note. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David said to Goliath, you come to me with all these ammunitions and weapons. I come to you in the name of the Lord my God. You defy this God, and in his name, I will crush you. And so he did. A man who never knew what before, who never fought what before, bringing down boastful Goliath. By the time he did that, the hopelessness of Israel disappeared. The doubt they had disappeared. And they became a proud people and victorious people. By this unique action, David stood in the gap for his people, for history, and for the glory of God. He rebuilt their trust of self-worthiness and recreated their hope in God. I believe very strongly that God will not raise any one of you up for any task, for any challenge, without equipping you for success. And therefore, for me, the starting point for leading others with hope, trust, and courage is the consciousness, absolute trust, and holy fear of God. In any human enterprise, for me, God is foundational. The moment you remove God out of the equation, you are inviting chaos. The Lord Christ said, and I quote, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. And happily, we have God's written word 
to encourage us, to challenge us, and to revitalize our faith. Now, what I call syndrome of Israel surrounds us on every side. For everywhere you go, across our communities, all over the countries, people are suffering from one form of terror or the other. The Goliath that they face is there in various ways. And all they are looking for is a David who will stand in the gap to restore their hope, to help them crush this enemy, this terror. People of God, there was a research that was done that showed that of 20 advanced industrialized countries, only 16 demonstrated a declining rate of monthly church attendance. What else further demonstrated the decay when, as reported by the Christianity Today magazine, Compared to 50% of Americans who claim that God is very important to their lives, 40% of Irish, 28% of Canadians, 26% of Spaniards, 21% of Australians, and 10% of French, a one-time French, uh, a Roman Catholic country, will affirm the omnipotence of God, only 10% in France. The rest want God out of public domain. The rest don't want to discuss anything about God in schools, in politics, and in business. And therefore, I think our world in which we live today is in danger of apostasy, with all its ruinous effects already manifesting its clear signs. Today in our world, there's huge turmoil. The wheel of our so-called civilization is recklessly spinning towards destruction. Because everywhere you turn, the omens are showing. Africa is ravaged by poverty, by wars, and by bad governance. Asia suffers intermittently from colossal natural disasters. Europe and America, as you all know today, seem in general to be parting ways with the very source of their being, with their creator, and thereby pursuing the path of self-destruction. Christianity, that we all claim to belong to, is not just about worship. It's equally for transforming the total being, to live a godly existence and be able to radiate the love of God in action to others. The problem we face in our world today are not new. They've always been there. And before us, God had raised key people like yourselves to tackle these problems. So let no one be weighed down because of the enormity of the problem. They can be overcome. You recall that from the very early days, the church found itself in errors. Arianism, Ascetism, Narcissism, Donatism, and so on and so forth. And in our own time, the church is in the era of false teaching about human sexuality. But whenever this era showed its ugly face, the Lord will raise people to contend for the faith. And so you will remember great church fathers, Tertullian, Athanasius, St. Augustine, and many others who did what we have been called upon to do today. Similarly, European fathers, your grandfathers or great-grandfathers in this continent, God raised them to fight the errors of their time, to fight the problems of their time. Do you remember John Calvin, Martin Luther, Thomas Cranmer, who fought gallantly and they challenged many of the false teachings that was upheld by the Roman church. These men were human, like we are, but God used them to bring about their change in their time. But not just in the church, even in the political arena, God raised great people, again, Europeans like yourselves, to stand in the gap and to make the difference. You remember that slavery was a popular thing 
in those days. And it took something like Willie Wilberforce for over 20 years of hard work to fight in the British Parliament to see to the end of slave trade. You remember the Supreme Prize paid by Martin Luther King Jr. Before Afro-Americans were no longer judged by the color of their skin, he paid the Supreme Prize. And for 27 years, for 27 long years, Nelson Mandela was in prison to free South Africa from the evil of apartheid. Now, not everyone who thought was possible, nor did all those who think possible prepared to make the sacrifice. They would prefer the status quo to continue. Today, we can do that. We must fight it, and we must win. In our time, in our era, in our generation, there are so many Goliaths facing us, so many difficulties, so many challenges facing us. But permit me to mention just three of them very quickly. The first I called unbridled secularism. I want to challenge us to think about your past, about your history. For I want to say that even if it is not a total truth or absolute fact, it is true to, to say that what is called European civilization today derives its life from and nurturing from your Judeo Christian heritage. The judicial, socio economic, and welfare systems, the various traditional institutions that nurtured the European society, sustained the impressive accomplishments, were all derived from your Christian heritage. So, why do people not give up Christianity? Why? Even the Bible defined heterosexual marriage and family life that are so basic units of society are crucial for its future existence. And today, these are not only being threatened, they are being attacked by the Goliath of secularism, by those who don't want God in the system. But I want to suggest to you that when those critical elements of European foundation are destroyed, there will be nothing else to hold on to and nothing to build on. It is imperative, therefore, that European church leaders should rise today courageously to defend and preserve your biblical roots and truths. The second challenge is what I call obsessive materialism. The developed world, particularly the West, has become so materialistic that virtually everything today is determined in monetary terms. Whereas my Bible tells me that human life does not consist in the abundance of what one possesses. But modern man insists that if anything is to have meaning or relevance, it must have monetary worth. Now, where on earth are the religious and spiritual values of the past that place emphasis on love, on peace, on hope, on justice? Where are they? They don't count any longer. So again, only men and women of courage can face this Goliath of our time and defeat it. Thirdly, it's of crucial importance that Europeans should wake up to the devastating challenge posed by Islam in our time. Because Islam is currently sweeping across the Western world. And one of the terrible side effects of materialism and secularism is the deep hole, the huge void that has been created in the spiritual life of the people. Slowly but steadily, Islam is poised to fill that vacuum. And so in many parts of Europe, Islamic fundamentalism is growing. Demand is being made that things be done to please the Muslims. And because of your emphasis on political correctness, you see them as being the ones who are right and the church people are the ones who are wrong. But have you noticed that in Europe today, the wearing of hijab, the, the, the things that the Muslims wear to cover their face, 
It's becoming more and more popular. The creation of Islamic schools is becoming very popular. Sharia banks, or at least Sharia compliant banks, whose profits are channeled to fund jihad in many parts of the world. It's becoming very popular. And yet, we don't see anything wrong in this. Now, let me sound a note of warning. Islam may not be using the force of arms to penetrate and to infiltrate the Western world, but it's using very cleverly what I call the erosion and corrosion of your values and cultures. Let me take one single example here. Democracy. You say it's a game of numbers, right? Democracy is a game of numbers. Whoever has the largest number is in charge. Now, with the huge demographic shift that has occurred in the last 20 years, and still growing in Europe, it's a matter of time when Muslims will muster the overriding majority in many European communities to swing the scale of political leadership. Where well, some will say, well, what does it matter? If they win, they win. Huh? Can you really afford to live under Islamic law? Can you afford to live under Sharia? Think about it. People of God, trust, truth, hope, courage are the basic elements that we all need in order to be able to, to challenge and to engage this Goliath of our time. Because I believe very strongly our world and the church are in what Paul would call perilous times. It goes beyond that. A contemporary church leader will need to build a hope ministry to be able to lift the poor and the downtrodden and show them that beyond the tunnel there is glorious light. In Europe, it is possible. In America, it is possible. In my context, we have done it. And here, you can do the same. Trust is a Different ballgame entirely. Because for me, trust identifies the character of leadership. Leadership, for me, spans over the parameters of competence, mastery, or proficiency in task handling. It requires truthfulness and sincerity. A wonderful leader, lacking in honesty, in my opinion, is simply irresponsible. And therefore, undependable. When you are irresponsible, as a leader, you cannot expect to have loyal fellowship. Unfortunately, if there is a virtue in leadership that is so lacking in our time, gravely in short, in short supply, it is trustworthiness. And this device does not spare any of the two major leadership spheres of secular and spiritual leadership. And may I ask you, how many of us here trust our governments and our political leaders that will be honest with us and do what they promise they will do. I don't, in my context, because in my context, politicians have done more to destroy the people than anything else. Innocent citizens have lost their lifetime savings to distressed banks and stock exchange crashes. Financial institutions and insurance companies have been compromised to the point of collapse. Workers' pension funds and gratuities have been embezzled. State funds are stolen with impunity. And all these are known to be done by our political leaders. I come from a country where the vast majority live in poverty in the midst of plenty. But here, maybe things are slightly different. But the facts still remain the same. Who can you really trust? Who can you really trust among our leaders, both in the church and in the state? But let me emphasize, 
the world in which we live will not suddenly turn to become good simply because we desire it to be so. Nor will we witness a sentence of right things and right virtues on the blast of a whistle. No, it won't happen. No form of evil will voluntarily depart our world without courageous and trustworthy leadership to champion their eradication. Like I mentioned earlier, great leaders like Martin Luther, like Thomas Cranmer, like William Wilberforce, like King David, all had these great virtues to accomplish what they accomplished. Permit me now to tell you very briefly some context in which I've experienced very powerfully courage, truth, and hope in my setting. There's some, a movement today that is called GAFCON. Have you ever heard about it before, GAFCON? GAFCON is the Global Anglican Future Conference, and it came about as a result of the intransigence and flagrant compromising of the truth of the gospel by leaders of the Anglican Church in America, in Canada, and in England. We did all we could to ask them to be faithful to the scriptures and to stand on the principles enshrined in what we call faith and order, but they will not. And so, we leaders from Latin America, from Asia, from Caribbean, and South America, who represent more than two-thirds of the global Anglicans, we conferred on what step to take. That was how GAFCON was born in Jerusalem in 2008. Now, many will see this as schismatic, but it is not. GAFCON came into being to hold leaders accountable. Because in 1998, we took a decision in Lambeth Conference in Canterbury that we uphold the authority and integrity of Scripture, that same-sex marriage is not part of God's plan for his world, and therefore we could not recommend it. And therefore some went in Canada and America to say, that is the only way, only way of life they will endorse. And we say, no, you couldn't do that. We won't let you do it. And that was the beginning of the battle. Things came headway in February 2008 in Tanzania when we had meet of the primates. And our so-called leader then, one Rowan Williams, is now res he resigned. I retired. He resigned. And those are two, big, two diff different things. <laughs> and he said, we wait to see who blinks first. That is, those of us who are upholding the authority of Scripture and those of them who are revisionists. He was waiting to see who will blink first. In other words, he was a referee in the game. For me, at that moment, he lost all rights to leadership. And so when we had GAFCON, it was meant to be a one-time thing off in 2008. But you know what? Second GAFCON has been held in Kenya with over 1,400 people from around the world attending. It's the only forum today in the Anglican Communion that has capacity to call people together like this, and they will respond joyfully to the glory of God. But all this is not without its own price. To come to this state, because they saw me as the leader, I was filibied, I was called names, I was literally demonized. But what does it matter? Jesus suffered much more. And they say, oh, those of our colleagues who are vulnerable financially, they cut off their source of funding. And I told them, poverty is my middle name, to hell with your money. The thought was a joke until I had to tell Rowan Williams that the road to God's kingdom does not pass through Canterbury or Lambeth Palace. If you stand true to the Bible, we are together. If you don't, you are on your own. 
And that was the point at which we know we have come to a point of no return. Until today, instead of coming back to the scripture, instead of doing what was necessary to become globally acceptable, they are using divisive methods, money and um, project funding to bribe leaders in Africa, in Asia, to come to their own position, to log on to their own template. Brothers and sisters, it's a very dangerous situation we're in at this point. So I want to say to you, as I conclude, that no matter what anybody may say, no matter what anybody may do, if you stand true to the gospel of Christ, he is always with you. There is nothing I have not suffered except that I've not lost my life. But in terms of human suffering and pain, I've gone through it all. And the Lord has continued to manifest his power and glory in my life. So church leaders today need to be more visionary and to be able to see in people and situations what they cannot see by themselves. Such leaders must then take people across the barrier of hopelessness to the panorama of hope, hope in Christ. And one of the most liberating discoveries anyone can make is that no problem is without solution. We only need to discover it. You church leaders in this continent must help your people to fight that negative attitude that says it's impossible and begin to say, in Christ, it is possible. And I tell you two quick stories. One, when I was the national president of Nigerian Christians, which included Roman Catholics and others, there was a big project called the National Christian Center to be built in our federal capital. For 18 years, it was abandoned because of disunity, because of lack of honesty on the part of our leaders. When I became president of Cannes, I said, we're going to build it. They doubted it, but God showed me the way, what to do, and I followed. In 18 months, it was built and dedicated. And you've been there. And it stands in the center of our capital in Abuja to the glory of God. God did it. It was possible. The cost alone was enough to scare any church leader. It cost over 4 billion naira. I don't know how much, divided by 150, 150, um, 4 billion divided by 150, you get the dollar equivalent. That was what it cost to build the center. And we raised the money and we built it. God did it. Second story. When this crash was raging in the church, in our, in our church, many Nigerians in America said they could no longer go to Episcopal church to worship. They didn't feel at home anymore. So we went in. And after a series of negotiations, we thought we could start Church of Nigeria for Nigerians in America. But in the end, it happened that there are more Americans who wanted to pull out of the Episcopal Church to join our group. And that was how Kenya was born. Kenya is a convocation of Anglican in North America. Convocation of Anglicans in North America. You can see all this on the website. Now, when I went to inaugurate Kenya nine years ago, the primate of tech, Episcopal Church, said to me, Peter, you know, you can't come to this church to start a new church. I mean, to this country to start a new church. Her name is Catherine Je Jeffrey Shorey or something like that. I call her Lady Shorey. And I said, oh, really? I thought this is America. God's own country. Freedom of choice. Freedom of association, to hell with you. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and she was so, she turned pale. Because I could use those words. I didn't miss words. I mean, I said to your superiors, much more than that before in Canterbury. So why to tell me where to come, where not to go? So we went ahead and we did it. Today, Kenya has over 100 congregations that no longer belong to the Episcopal Church. And thereafter, what they call ACNA, also came into being. All I'm going to say is this. From far away Nigeria, 14 hours flight, we went to plant church in America 
that is today growing by leaps and bounds. God did it. If we have not done that, those men and women, those children in that church, will have become churchless people. Your situation may not be as bad as that. But I don't know what you contend against. But Jude has advised all of us to contend for the faith. Whatever is your situation, whatever is your circumstance, if you are truly believing in Christ and loving and serving him, you can do even much more. If I can do it, you can do much more. Because you are better resourced than I will ever be in my situation. I'm happy that this forum is all about equipping national Christian leaders on how to renew biblical church and to re-evangelize Europe. And God will help you to achieve that. Your goal is to bridge, to provide a bridge between God's global resources and local leaders all over Europe. Now, and these are well-formulated objectives. Now, in the last few days, you've been here from all over Europe and America. You've been discussing, you've been deliberating, you've been praying, you've been hearing lectures on various issues concerning the church. In my opinion, now is the time for action. All those lectures, all those Bible, uh, um, uh, Bible, uh, Bible teachings, all those prayer sessions, all those singing, all those worship sessions, they are not a mere form of entertainment. They are to prepare you to send you forth into the world to go and love and serve the Lord amongst your people. Anything else, anything less will not do. Now is the time that God is calling from among you here modern-day King David, modern-day Martin Luther, modern-day Calvin, modern-day Martin Luther King, and so on and so forth. Who will stand in the gap? Who will uphold the truth? Who will stand courageously to stand against all the Goliaths confronting the church and our nations? You dare not compromise the gospel imperative on the altar of political correctness. You don't belong to that. This is the time to lead those God has committed to your charge. Nothing less will do. But the question is, are you on the Lord's side? Have you been here this week and been merely entertained? Or have you been charged, you've been equipped to go out there and get the job done. 